Hello everybody, uh, I'm going to make a video about my Saab or SAB Goblin 500. Now it's not just a pretentious video, this is actually a video to show you one, the electronics and the setup that I've gone over uh, with the Goblin and compare it to its performance on the data logs of the Castle ESC. Uh, this is because I believe one, that the castle is the weak point of all the electronics here, and two, just to give an idea of what kind of stresses the electronics are going under during flight. Uh, the second part of the video is actually go, go over the data logs and see any weak points within the performance of the ESC or any other component that we can spot through the data logs. So it's basically two parts. First part, electronic setup, second part, data logs. All right, and I'll go over a few mechanical and electronic uh, peculiarities that are on my particular helicopter and ways that I've, uh, or modifications that I've come up with to get around them. You might find them useful. I know I did. It was a little bit of research that I had to do and uh, a little bit of quote unquote hacking <laughs> into the electronics. I wouldn't call it hacking, but you know, a little little tricks of the trade, I guess. But anyway, let's start the video in terms of going over all the electronics. I'm going to save the ESC for last. Now, you probably already see what it is, but in any event, I'm going to save it for last in terms of introduction. I'm going to try to move the helicopter a little bit closer to the camera so you can get a better picture of the electronics I'm using. All right, first and foremost, you can already see this from a distance. We're using the Scorpion 4020 1350 KV motor. Uh, it's probably one of the high performance motors that's recommended by SAB. I know there's others, but it's probably one of the most high performance motors recommended by Saab. <coughs> so, it's obviously we know it gets a lot of heat and it does a lot of stress on the ESC. Next thing, cycle servos are Futaba BLS 153. These are recommended quote unquote hard 3D servos from SAB. There's a lot of other servos guys are using. I'm not comparing, I'm not saying, but it is a recommended quote unquote hard 3D high performance servo from SAB. Uh, and it's kind of funny because if you look at the specs, they're not the fastest servo out there. They're supposed to have a lot of torque, but other than that, I mean, they perform great, don't get me wrong, but there are servos with better specs, so let's not kid ourselves there. But they're, they're relatively, I mean, they're, they're good performing servos. Um, on the tail, we're using it's hard to see, but the tail servo is a JRMP82G high voltage servo. It's very fast. It's a very good servo. I, I really like it. Um, it's, they don't recommend tail servos, or at least then I've seen on, on from SAB. But this is a very good tail servo. Uh, very few people run them, but um, the specs are very good. It's very quick. I don't remember exactly the torque and the speed off the top, but it's one of the higher end. Uh, servos that you can get for your tail. Um, let's see what else. The fly baller system. I went with, you can see that, it looks like a Spartan Quark, but it's actually a Spartan Vortex. It's actually the sensor of the Spartan Vortex. The rest of it is in the back. The controller unit, it's kind of hard to see, but it's back there. It's kind of dark in there, but believe me, it's there. Uh, it's a Spartan Vortex VX1. Uh, the reason why I went with the Spartan Vortex VX1, well, uh, truthfully, I'm a Spartan fanboy, and it's not because I've flown a lot of VX1s, it's because I've flown a, a couple of Spartan Quarks, and I love the Quark. Uh, it's, it's, and it's not just me, a lot of people like the Quark. Uh, I've gone through a lot of gyros when I, my fly bar days, and they all sucked. <laughs> they, I, I got the Assassin, the, the knockoff Futaba. I mean, I'm sure the, the genuine Futabas are okay. I had the knockoff Futabas. All the cheap 15 20 $30 servos. I mean, sorry, gyros. And um, they just didn't hold the tail. I mean, they might hold it for one day, and they wouldn't hold it another day, or they wouldn't hold it in a punch-out. You know, they just... Uh, some guys have good luck with them. Not me. So, my friend recommended, and he used it on his uh, 450s, uh, Spartan Quark. Uh, they were going relatively cheap because everybody was going fly barless, so I bought a couple for $50 and uh, 
and it was a world of difference. Uh, the Spartan Quark is probably one of the best, simplest, smallest <laughs> gyros that you will ever come across. Uh, I've never heard a bad word about them. I'm sure somebody has something bad to say, but they are great, great piece of electronics. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the Spartan fanboys, like myself, were waiting for a fly ballish unit to come out. And uh, even though uh, Spartans were saying that they were going to come out with one, and they were, they were developing it, it just took a long time. And in the meantime, a lot of other good fly ball systems came out. You know, you had the Brain, you had the, um, the Mini V-Bar, you had the B-Stacks, which I run on my 450s now. And the B-Stacks are great. They're very simple to set up. I love them. Uh, but when I built this sub, I definitely wanted to go with something that I had great familiarity with in terms of their previous products. And I just want to go a little bit high end, quote unquote. It costs more, you know, than probably your average fly ball system. Uh, it runs about $350 with the data pod, or $370 with the data pod that you need for programming. So it costs a little bit more, but it's, it so far performs great. Uh, I still need to dial in a little bit just for my particular flying style, but also maybe because I need to get used to flying a bigger size heli, but it's stable. The, the tail is solid as a rock. It's easy to set up. Um, had no problems with it. Great, great unit. Alright, enough of that. Um, let's see. I am running for a separate BEC. The separate BEC that I'm running is... Uh, I'll show it to you. It's under here. Looks very nice. It is the Quasar... Uh, sorry, Griffin Quasar uh, GSR 7075 LMT. It's a high voltage... Uh, BEC, it looks very nice. Supposedly, Griffin is a relatively young company, but as far as BECs, this is one of their top BECs. It's 12S capable. Um, it has, if you want, you can put a, an on off switch on it and um, it actually lights up and blinks. It's a very good looking BEC. Um, they have great customer service. Uh, I happened to pick one up for about $70 in Heli Freak. Somebody brand new in the package, somebody was selling it. They usually run about $90. Uh, before that, I was actually running the Castle uh, BEC Pro. Um, it's a good BEC. It's just, if you look at the difference, this one looks like a bed of nails. And uh, I had it mounted under here, and it was just really annoying. Um, and it was uh, just aesthetically, just didn't, didn't look good. So it was, uh, I got rid of it. I mean, this runs about probably 30 bucks, as opposed to one that runs 90 bucks. So. So far, you can see most of the electronics are pretty, pretty uh, high performance electronics. Let's see, anything else? I will say this I'm running a full receiver. Again, it's in the back compartment. I'm not sure if you can see it, but it is an AR6210 receiver, and I'm running it with a satellite. Um, why am I running a full receiver and not just satellites? Well, and why am I running a six channel receiver? Well, because I have a six channel radio. <laughs> Uh, yep, I know, it sounds a little weird that I'm running a six channel radio. Yeah, I'm still running a DX6i even with a Saab 500. And here's the reason, I've never needed a seventh channel. I don't run nitros, uh, I don't plan to run nitros, so I've never needed the seventh channel. As you all know, helis, oh well, you have one, two, three, four servos, um, and your ESC, that's five channels. You, that's all you really need, the six channel is what, for your gyro usually, right? and your gyro control. So you never really need the seven channels or eight channels that you get. Now there's other things that you get with them, right? With the DX7 you get more models, with DX8 you get a second idle up, and that's probably the only reason I would go to that. But at this point, uh, running a full receiver with the Goblin, or with any other of my helis, is fine. Actually I use the B-Stex, uh, they are 7200 on my other one, so it's still just one unit. So it's not a problem. Um, I know a lot of guys like to run just the uh, satellites, which is fine. Uh, it makes it a little bit cleaner, and you don't have all those wires going from your fly balls controller to a full receiver. But I find it a little bit more convenient. Plus, I think you know, with a full receiver, you have a fail-safe feature, which you don't with the satellites, and you can bind it, you know, to any radio, including the DX6 all the way up to whatever the DXX, I guess you want to call it that. So I'm running the full receiver there, uh, and I'll say one thing. The only problem with running a full receiver and these Quasar, or not even the Quasar BECs, even the Castle Pro. Here's what you're going to see with the Castle Pro or any BEC. It's going to have two wires. 
Why? Because these are high output BECs. So they run 10 amps continuous, 20 amps max. Now you're going to have two wires which supply power because a single wire is too low rated for the type of amperage that these put out. So now you think about it, where are you going to put these wires in the six channel receiver? Well, you can put it in your bind, your bind data port or your bind port. Um, that's like the last, it's like the seventh channel that's used for binding, or not channel, but a uh, port that's used for binding. You can do that, so you, that's still, you can do that, it'll, it'll, it'll supply power to the receiver, but you still have an extra one, right? Now you don't have to use this, or you could use a Y plug, some guys do that, but that sort of defeats the purpose of having, right, two of these to give you uh, rated power on the wires. So what I did, and this is one of my little hacks, if you want to call it that, I noticed and in every fly ball unit I've seen this, it usually has one of these plugs. This is from a ZYX, uh, right? It has a single plug which splits out into three. But if you look, these three plugs are only being used once, or one of the sockets inside the plugs. Only one lead is used. So you have two leads free. This is, this is also true of the Vortex. It's also true of the V-bar, and it's probably true of every other fly ballers unit that uses a full, a full receiver. You're going to get one of these plugs that you need to use. So basically, you have a plug with two other leads, which happen to be the power and ground lead that you can use for the BC. So basically what you would do is remove the two leads from the BC and put them in the two empty sockets on the fly ballless wire. So take the two here, take them out of here, you can just and put them in there. It's one of my little tricks. So if you're a crazy person who runs only six channels on a fly ballless and you're running a full you're running a full receiver with a large BEC which requires two inputs. Or if you have any other power inputs that you need, you can do this little hack. Would I recommend it? I don't know, I've had no problems, and I don't see any difference, because remember, your bottom two, always for the BEC, are going to be a power, so just putting it on a different lead, I don't think it's going to change anything. Alright, so, last but not least, in far of our electronics, we went with the Castle Phoenix Ice 100. Now, you're probably asking, why'd you do that when the recommended ESC is the Talonite? Um, I was going to go with Talonite, simply because I'm familiar with uh, Castle products and I've ha had no problems with them. However, why didn't I go with Talon 90? Simple. The Talon 90 does not have data logging. And I came across that, and one of the great features of, to me about Castle is their data logging. It gives you a lot of information. Um, I have two 450s with Castle's Ice Light 50s running in them, no problems. And the data logs tell me a lot of information that I've used. You know, it tells me once I hit low voltage cutoff, so uh, I was able to see what was going there. I had to, I got to see temperatures, uh, amperage spikes, RPMs. It's just a lot of information packed in those data logs. Now, whatever else you can say about Castle products in terms of, um, a lot of people don't like them in terms of their, uh, well, sometimes they burn up, some people claim. Or they, you actually see them, I'm not going to say claim, you see people burnt up their ESCs. I have not had that problem, but what you can't say is that they don't have a great informational um, logging. I mean, they, they've really done a good job with that, and it just gives you a lot of information about what's going on during your flight, and that's why we're going to go over that during the second part of the video. Um, but that's why I went with the ICE. Now, why I went with the 100? Well, uh, there I didn't do a lot of research in terms I just figured, well, they're using 90, that's a 90 amp. Um, so I figure I go with the hundred, right? That would work. Um, now some guys say you should go with the one twenty or the one forty. And actually, if you look at the re re recommended ESCs, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The recommended ESCs from Saab are basically three brands, right? We have obviously the Castle Talon, which is recommended. Now you have the YGE, and you also have the Contronic. Now there's two different versions depending if you want the hard 3D or the regular 3D um, setup. Either way, if you look at YGE and you look at Contronic, both of which I've never used, you know, um, 
again, I've just been flying 450s and, you know, I pretty much mid-end stuff on that. Um, they run $250 to $350. I'm sure they're great ESCs. I'm sure they have a lot of features, governors, you know, that people love. I haven't heard any complaints about them. And in terms of, you haven't seen anything about them burning up. So I'm sure that fact alone, a lot of guys are saying, you know, that they're great ESCs, you know, as, as compared to castles. However, I spent enough money. I thought the Vortex was going to be the main thing I was going to spend money on in terms of high end. Uh, the motor, as you know, is almost $200, plus the Vortex is $350, the servos were $100 each for cyclic, this was a $150 servo. So, either way, I thought I spent enough, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Even the, the, the Quasar, that's a, that's, a, that's a $100 BEC, it's a $100 BEC. So, now you could have said, well, between the Quasar and all the other stuff I bought, you could have just went with the Contronic, right? I'm not sure how I pronounced the other thing, but either way, maybe I could have, and maybe I will. Because, like I said, this is the weak point, and there's a lot of uh, concerns I have about this. One, as you know, because of the design, the ICE 100 gets very hot. So does the Scorpion, but everybody says the Scorpion. I don't really care if it gets hot, as long as it doesn't get too hot that it burns the band, and that, you know, it, it doesn't damage anything. You can run as hot as you want, as long as you don't damage anything. Um, as you know, this has a belt, which goes onto the gear. Oh, I'm running 16T, by the way, with the 13 so, yeah, that's probably, you can probably run 15, but 16, I get it. I'm running at 2600 right now. Some guys, you can, you can go up to 27. They say basically 26 to 2750 is what this is rated at with the 16T. And that's good for me. You know, I'm sport flying, beginning 3D, stuff like that. So I'm not doing anything crazy. But the castle is getting hot, and that's what we want to take a look at. All right, last thing before I go on to the data logs is a little modification I did. Now, this is all about the difference between paper and aesthetics and getting a balance there. Um, here's something I've noticed. On paper, what castle recommends that your linkages be? It tells you approximately your, your linkage rod assembly B should be 44.5, approximately. Now, approximately me means plus or minus, what, two millimeters? And from eye hole to eye hole, or from hole to hole, it should be 35.5 millimeters. Now, I've discovered if you use those recommended lengths, even if you go a little bit above, I'm talking about plus or plus two millimeters, your washout arms here, these washout arms, will not be parallel. They'll look like an arc, you know? And to me, I was just like, that looks weird. You know, in every other heli that I've had, fly ballers or fly, everything was perpendicular. At least the washout arms, you know, should be perpendicular to your head block or your frame. So I just made them the length that would make them perpendicular to the frame. I mean, not perpendicular, parallel to the frame or parallel to themselves. Uh, and I didn't see any reason not to because you still get maximum range uh, on, you know, from upper swash range to lower swash range, so I didn't see any reason not to. So that's just me, so if you're a little, if you guys are, want to go with the recommended lengths, I'm sure, you know, you can. It's just aesthetic that you might have a little, it might not be perfectly parallel, but I don't see any reason why you can't. Okay, there's no mechanical limitations why you couldn't raise this enough past the 35 point, the 35.5 millimeter recommended lengths. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is, as far as recommended lengths, it also recommends that your servo horns, the hole that's used for your servo horns, um, uh, the distance between the center and the, whatever hole you choose should be 16 to 18 millimeters. Now, that's important, if only because you need to have proper resolution to make sure that your fly barless unit can do everything. You know, or at least, you know, it can fly and have maximum range on the servos well, the server's going to give the range that you need in order for it to fly properly. Not just properly, but, you know, if you're going to do any precision type of flying, that it's going to have the type of resolution. So that's something you don't really, at least in my opinion, you know, I'm not an expert on these things, that you don't want to mess around with. You don't want to mess around with this distance. Now, I've discovered, at least using these servos, the Futaba, and even looking at a few pictures online, if you use that particular, the hole that gives you the 16 to 18 millimeters, that these linkages might not be perpendicular to your frame. Again, you know, there's a little arch, maybe four degrees, five degrees, nothing huge. And again, it's more aesthetic than anything else. 
but I like, you know, like anybody else, you would like these to be perpendicular, right? So, but there's not much you can do about that unless you go to this, the, the shorter linkage hole, which would be 14 millimeters, at least with these particular servos. And if you did that, even with all the modifications that they give you, not modifications, but the alterations that you can set these servos up, because you set these servos up different ways with the carbon fiber bracket, you still will get that arch. Um, you know, just that distance is hard to mod you can't really modify because these brackets, you know, if your servers fit them the, the way they go, you can't do much about it. So you get that, you know, just won't be perpendicular to your frame. So I did something to get them virtually perpendicular. Now you get two sets of these carbon fiber sets with your, I think I you get three depending on the size of your server. Now each one, you know, ones are a little bit smaller and a little bit bigger and you pick the one that fits your servo. Um, I took one of the smaller ones and what I did with a file and a Dremel, I filed off, not filed off, but filed down the back end. This way the servos would be pushed back, pushed back this way, giving me, or at least making them more perpendicular or the linkage rods more perpendicular to the frame. So essentially what I did, I filed it down maybe three millimeters, then I re-drilled the holes with the Dremel carefully, and it came out pretty good. I mean, it took a while, <laughs> you know, and it's more, it's more for aesthetic purposes. I know I don't have it set up, so we're all the washout arms are 90 right now, but if they are 90, you'll see that it's virtually perpendicular to the frame, and I still get the 16 to 18 millimeter recommended distance that Sal recommends in the book. Okay, now you can, it's hard to see on camera, but you can see that they're virtually perpendicular. They might be off by a millimeter or so, but I can live with that. Before they were off by maybe a few degrees. You know, you look at it and you can definitely see that there was an arch, like, you know, from here to here. And I think even the picture that Saab has, there's an arch on it. So, and it didn't change anything. I mean, everything still, you still get the resolution. The servers just pushed back a little bit because I filed down the uh, car. And it doesn't cost you anything because you're using something that came with the kit anyway. I just used, I was using one of the larger ones, so I used one of the smaller ones and filed it back. Now, if you're using, already using one of the smaller ones, I don't know what you're going to do. <laughs> I, uh, you, I guess you could make it f fresh from scratch, but that would be uh, very difficult. Anyway, I've talked long enough about my setup, and those are pretty much all the little mods. I probably have one or two other mods that I did, but those, I think, are the ones that might want to take advantage of. All right, so I'm going to stop this now, then we're going to go into our ESC logs from the castle.